Here I am. <laughs> uh, 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 I honestly hope that worked. Um, again, I, I don't know until the recording goes. Um, but I thought that was appropriate because of uh, the Halloween. I'm, again, still trying to figure out how to get my kids in here to do the big one. That'd probably be at the end. So, anyway. Uh, so, today I am sure this is a pen that works yep uh properties of stars okay so today let me bring it up a little bit that uh, no over and I know I make a lot of weird noises. Uh, so today we're going to talk about the properties of stars that we can tell from the gathered radiation. So, and you know, that's key is that this is all derived from gathered radiation. Uh, again, something, and I've reiterated. I've reiterated. I find astounding is that this is all just from the photons, and the radiation that's leaving the stars. We're able to figure all these out. Okay, so first property. Um, luminosity. Okay, so what do we refer to? I mean, what is referred to by the term luminosity? Um, luminosity is referring to the amount of energy that a star produces over a period of time. So over an hour, a second, a week, a year, something. That's the luminosity. So the amount of energy it produces. So this is the amount of total energy. This is not just a fraction of it, this is the total energy. Energy produced by a star over some period of time. Now, I'm not going to get into the in a period of time, but this is the idea. This is a total energy. The whole thing is producing, so it's giving off. Um, obviously, you know, we don't know, well, for instance, you know, something like the sun, looking at the sun, if we collect the total energy that we're getting, and that's only a portion. So we have to figure we're only getting a portion of that and then calculate what the whole total would be. So, I mean, if you kind of want to look, we're, we're only seeing half the sun, so we have to calculate that the other half is doing the same in the other direction, uh, calculate the total. Um, this is an absolute value for a star. So this is something that you could say that this, this doesn't change distance or whatnot. It's an absolute uh, for that star. Uh, the problem that we have, so now with, with determining the luminosity of a star, so we've initially got a problem in determining this in that we only receive a fraction on Earth. Okay, so, I mean, you, you think about it, you got a, a star and it's radiating out energy in every direction, and here we are on Earth, we're only getting that tiny little We're only getting that tiny little section of it. And maybe with this illustration, what we have to figure out, so if we're only getting that tiny illustration, we need to figure out what percentage, uh, what percentage that tiny fraction is of the total. Now, 
this is going to vary because if we were here and getting that tiny fraction, this is, is much less spread out than it is here. And so critical part that we're missing here is the distance to the star. So to count, okay, so I mean, I'm going to backtrack just a little bit. So we only receive a tiny fraction. This fraction we that we get is referred to as brightness. And that is the fraction of energy from a star that we receive. So the big deal with brightness is that it can really vary depending on the distance. So there's two factors that would determine the brightness for a star. It would be the size of that star and the distance that star is away. If I've got a really big star and it's close to us, it's going to appear super bright. If I've got a really big star far away, it's going to appear dim. But I could have a really small star super close, and it would appear really bright. And a small star far away might disappear. So if I see a bright star in the sky, I can't say, is that a big star far away or a small star close? Because what I really need to have is distance. So I need to know the brightness, how much of this energy I'm getting, and then the distance away to be able to calculate luminosity. Okay, so with this, then, you kind of want to think of this. I've got luminosity, distance, and brightness. And if you kind of think of this as a triangle, um, if I know brightness and I know the distance, I can calculate the luminosity. Now, here's something, and I'll get, get into this in a, a little bit more. If I happen to know the luminosity of a star, and you might say, well, how would I know the luminosity first? Well, we've studied enough stars in the sky that we could go up and look at one, get the spectra of that star and say, this is the exact same spectra curve as the sun. Uh, maybe it's just less because it's farther away. So I know what type of star it is. So I know what the luminosity is. Well, if I know the luminosity and then I know the brightness on earth, I can figure out the, the approximate distance to the star. So. If you have any two, you can figure out the third. Um, so, it, well, brightness is always given. So this is something we always have. That's, you know, we see the star, we know the brightness. If I have distance, I can calculate luminosity. If I know the luminosity, because I know what type of star it is, I can calculate the distance to it. So that is key to figure out. So from just the radiation that I'm gathering, I can start to get an idea of how much radiation, how much energy that star is producing. I can know its luminosity. Okay, so that is quality. Oh, so the measure of luminosity. measurement. Okay, this is one of these things where I kind of, I personally have an issue with the way uh, astronomers have this set up, but again, I am not an astronomer, so nobody asked me, so I would change this. Okay, so the measurement system. Okay, so the first system we have is the, is the measurement for brightness. So this is the older system, the measurement for brightness. And that is something called apparent magnitude. And if you ever see this associated with a star, it is written as a little m. So it might be like negative 
a little m. So, uh, as an example. Okay, so apparent magnitude was the scale set up by a Greek uh, astronomer uh, in the second century BC. Wait, why we're stuck with it, I don't know. So, the scale that this guy came up with is he said that zero is going to be the brightest star he could see. And for that one, he thought it was serious. Okay, then he's going to say a step down, slightly dimmer, would be a first class star. So that's going to be slightly dimmer. Then there's second class stars, which are a little dimmer still. Uh, dimmer, -er. and this is dimmer, -er, er. Okay, you get the picture. So, but and now this makes for a weird scale that the higher the number is, the dimmer the star. And I don't agree with that scale. I think that the brighter the star, the bigger the number. Give the star, the lower the number. Anyway, that's the scale that we had. Now, as uh, astronomy got better, and when we could start actually measuring the amount of light. Um, they had to uh, adjust the scale to figure out, okay, which one is actually dimmer? This was, because first of all, this was just opinion. Second, then they had to come up with a system that started to say, okay, this is measurably. So not qualitative, meaning guessing, but quantitative, I could measure it. So, and then, then this is worth that the difference between this is 2.5 times. I don't know why it is 10 or one or something, but it's that, it's 2.5, which makes that when you get to this, zero to two is 6.25 times. Anyway, it's, it's a weird scale. So that's the scale for uh, apparent magnitude. And so bigger number, dimmer star. Well, this scale is absolutely useless, except for those people just looking at the stars from Earth, because the scale is only going to tell you which one's brighter, which one's dimmer. So we need a scale to actually measure luminosity. And so for luminosity, and I don't know why they did this, they kept the same scale system, but they had to somehow come up with a way in which the stars were equal. And so the way they did this, and I don't know how they end up doing this, they acted as if each star was 10 parsecs, which is a weird measurement, but it's about 35 light years away from Earth. How bright would they all look if they were lined up 35 light years from Earth? And so this one is called absolute magnitude. And this is a capital M. So same idea if you say minus 0.21 capital M, that's absolute. The, the, the only thing you really need to know with this scale is this is the comparable scale. This is the measure of the absolute energy. So if you have one star that's minus two and then one that's minus five, the minus five is putting out more energy than the minus two. It is a more energetic star. So it's the same system so going down, except now this is comparing them at an absolute. So this is as if all stars 35 light years from Earth. We really don't need to, you really don't need to understand the, the system. You just need to appreciate that this number, that the big M absolute is a comparable. It is absolute range. So if you've got one that's higher, one that's lower, you know what I say. But again, the lower the number, the more energetic the star. That's what I don't like about it. Okay. So property number two. Distance. We saw where, as I just explained with luminosity, distance is important to figure out how you can get to uh, a star, the distance. Okay, so distance. There's a couple of ways that we can get distance. Um, 
because distance becomes kind of difficult to figure out. Um, so uh, obviously the closer things are, the more accurate the measurements can be. Things that are farther away, uh, galaxies and such, it becomes much more uh, of a guesstimation. I'll get to that. So first way, something called parallax. A parallax is the same way in which we judge distance with two eyes. I don't know if you knew that, but the having two eyes allows us to judge the distance. So if you hold a, a pen out in front of your, your face, you can tell that that's closer than this is. So, um, And the reason that happens is one eye takes a picture in this direction, one eye takes a picture in that direction, and your brain actually puts the two images together, and it is learned that it's that far away. It's not something you're born with. I mean, if you've actually watched small children, uh, it takes a while for your brain to start to learn these distances. It has to record them and, and figure it out. So, and I mean, you can tell, because if you blink back and forth, it looks like the object's moving back and forth. This eye sees it looking like, oh, it's over there. And this eye sees it like it's over there, but it's actually right in the middle. It's a, two pictures put, put together. Uh, we do the same thing um, with the earth and I got to pause because I got to set it up. I got a picture for you. Hey, hey, I'm over here. Uh, join me. Okay, oh, I have my pointy stick. Okay, so the way the parallax, parallax works for Earth is that we take a picture of a, of a star from one side of the sun going this way. So here's the nearby star, and we take it against the background stars. Okay. Then in six months, when we're on the other side of the sun, take a picture of the star looking this way, and the background changes. So that shift in the background of stars, uh, they are able to calculate the angle of, we know the distance from the earth to the sun. And then so using uh, geometry, if I know this, that's 90 degrees, I've calculated this angle. I can calculate what the distance is out to that star approximately. So now the problem with parallax, and you might see this is as things are close, the angles are small, but as it gets farther away, this angle starts to approach 90, which means that small variations of this angle are gonna cause a, a radical change in distance. So only about 400 light years away does parallax work. So parallax is only good for finding distance to uh, the, the near neighborhood of stars in our galaxy. And it's a very small neighborhood. The galaxy is about 160,000 light years across. And we can only figure out with parallax the closest 400 stars. So, okay. Uh, where do you say go over here? Grab my pen. Go back over here. So, Okay, so parallax. Okay, so this is like your eyes. And this is good to about 400 light years away. So Okay, so for other stars, we can use something called spectroscopic parallax. And I'm going to have to wait and explain this one at the end because this is getting all ahead of ourselves in a certain chart. But basically, the idea is if I know, this is going back to what I was talking before, if I know what type of star it is, um, the, the type of star it is, I can get an idea 
of how far it is. So I know what the luminosity is. I can figure the distance uh, based on the, the, the star. So I know, I know it's this type of star. I know the brightness and I can figure out the distance. So this is a piece for this. So, um, so how can I? Okay, so this is if luminosity is known. Okay. More in a few minutes. Okay. Okay, so what about stars that are um so this is this is pretty good for finding stuff inside our galaxy um but what if we're and, and so parallax is close by spectroscopic parallax is basically used for stuff still in our galaxy so this is these are for these are actually for individual stars okay but our galaxy is only one of, of a gazillion out there. And most of the objects that we're looking at are beyond our, our, our galaxy. So how do we figure out the distances to those? Well, there's a couple of ways to do that. One is using a Cepheid variable star. Now this is a case where there are certain there are stars that in a certain period uh, of their life actually fluctuate. Um, they literally pulse back and forth, and we'll get to that in a later lecture. But it's undergone a change internally. It's gone from fusing helium into hydrogen, and it was an explosive change. So it didn't just gradually go. It went from fusing one to boom, fusing the other. And the outside of the star is literally kind of like when you pluck a string. It's, it's going back and forth. So the internally, it kind of exploded, it's collapsed and exploded and collapsed and like a car with bad shocks, this thing is still bouncing after hitting a pothole. Well, these stars go back and forth. Well, as these stars pulse back and forth, their luminosity change, they get brighter and dimmer and brighter and dimmer. They do it at a very specific um, pace. So we know if they're getting brighter and dimmer every couple of days, they're absolutely this luminosity. If they're doing it over a couple months, they're this luminosity. So given how the rate at which it pulses is gonna indicate what its luminosity is. If we know the luminosity, we already know the brightness, we can calculate the distance. Um, this was actually a technique that um, Hubble used to determine the distance to the Andromeda galaxy, the first galaxy that was discovered outside of our own. He actually had to wait around till he discovered in the pictures of the, the, uh, the Andromeda galaxy, a Cepheid variable star. And once he, he got that, he was able to, to calculate, in this case, the distance was about 2 million light years away, not inside our galaxy. Like, Woo. So this is finding luminosity based on pulsing star. So, okay, hold up just a minute. Hey, sorry, I've had a visitor I had to deal with here in the class, so try to make, okay. Um, okay, and if I believe remember, so the seven variable stars that they are pulsing stars, if you know the period that it is, you can calculate the luminosity, you know the luminosity, you know the brightness, you can calculate the distance uh, to those, to the star or the groupings of stars. So 
for this, this is going to give you an estimate of distance to that star and the, and the groupings of stars around you. So this is uh, kind of an estimate of distance. You're not going to, you know, 200 million light years or so. You're not going to know the exact down to a light year. So this is a, now the last one. Oh, um, supernovae. It's, that's the plural. It's not supernovas, it's supernovae, because it's a, anyway. Um, supernovas or supernovae. Um, these are great, again, for the same thing, because these supernovas, as we'll get to, always release the same amount of energy when they explode. And it's just because it's like a tipping over a bucket. When the bucket's completely full, whoop, it falls, everything comes out. So you know what the amount is. By the time they explode, they all explode with the same amount of energy. So these always release the same luminosity. So if you can catch a supernova explosion, you have to go back and say, okay, how much did I get from that star? Or yeah, how much did we get from that explosion? You know, I know how much it was. I can figure the distance. And these two are, again, good for galaxies. So looking for a galaxy, see if you have a little supernova explosion in that galaxy. And then the last distance here is something called the Hubble Cosmological Redshift. Okay, so Hubble noticed that ga all galaxies are, due to the Doppler shift, redder than they appear to be. And when he plotted them out, what he noticed is the farther away a galaxy is, the redder it appears. Um, and it is a constant, it's a linear graph. So by linear, you see, he found that it, it does exactly this. So as this gets you know, redder, the distance gets longer. So if I've got something that's redder, it's farther away. It's even more redder, it's even farther away. And so with this redshift, and we'll get into more of the implications of this in the, the galaxy, but that you can tell galaxies, the estimate of galaxies far away based upon how red they have been shifted by the um, Doppler shift. So, so this is a caused by the Doppler shift uh, moving away, which makes it redder. And this again, it, and it's a constant uh, shift. And all of these here are used basically for galaxies. Okay, so Temperature, composition, both of these Both of these are determined by uh, through the spectrum. Okay, and if you remember, we talked about with the temperature, where this peak curve is, is going to, so where, where I have this maximum intensity wavelength, that's going to indicate whether it's hotter or cooler. Shifting this way is a cooler temperature. Shifting this way 
is a hotter temperature, but where that, that, that wavelength is, is gonna give me an idea of what the surface temperature of that star is. So gathering up that whole spectra, I can go, okay, that's the temperature of the star. Composition, that's gonna come from the same thing, but there with composition, I'm looking for those little gaps to see what these line up with, what these gaps are. This is an absorption spectra. And I'm looking for the elements that correspond to those absorption. So in looking at the spectra, the gaps that are in that absorption spectra will line up with wavelengths of the absorption of certain elements. And I can figure out that this has got you know, hydrogen and helium and titanium oxide and, and calcium and other uh, items in it. So looking at the spectra, I'm gonna get the temperature of the composition uh, of those. Size. Okay, and this is going to get us an approximate size. And the way that they determine size is based upon um, temperature and luminosity. So, so kind of get if I've got temperature. I've got luminosity. We're going to get size. Okay. Now, if I have something that is uh, hot, but so its surface temperature is extremely hot, but its luminosity, so I've got a hot temperature but I've got a low luminosity. Okay, what does that indicate about the size? Hotter things are gonna put off more energy. Cooler things put off less energy. Okay. If this is extremely hot, but it's low luminosity, this is going to be a small size. Because if it's really hot, it should be putting off a lot, but I don't have a lot. And the only way I can do that is by having a smaller object. So a real small one that's super hot is going to produce something that, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. If I got something that's super hot and no luminosity, the only way to do it is by having something real small. So what if I have something that has a low temp, but it has a high luminosity well, the only way to do that would be the opposite. This has to be giant. So it's relatively cool. It's not putting off a lot. Well, if it's put it, I mean, it's, it's not, it's, it wouldn't be putting out all that much energy. Well, if it is, it would have to be super huge. So there you go. Now, how could I have a star that is small? put out the same amount of energy as something big, but it'd be the difference in temperature. This one would have to be hot. This one have to be cool for these two to be equal. So, okay. So that's how you're gonna get the size. So you need a temp and luminosity. Calculate the size of it. Okay. Mass of a star. The only way that you can determine the mass of a star is if the star is actually in um, gravitationally uh, locked with a, another star, so, uh, or interacts gravitationally with another star, because you have to see the motion of uh, the star to see to calculate what the mass is. So you have to use um, Newton's laws of physics 
and I see how the thing is moving to say, okay, I can figure out the mass if it's that far away and moving this fast. So, um, but then we've seen so many stars, we've seen so many times, so we can say that the sun weighs this much, you know, these stars weigh this much based upon the calculations we have done with stars that are gravitationally um, interacting with other stars. And you just say, okay, this is, it's similar to this, so it must be, you know, the same as that. So this is determined from uh, stars interacting with others gravitationally. Okay, so you got to use use physics. You calculate it, you can figure out what it is. Okay, the last one that you can do is motion. And the motion, I think we mentioned before, this is with the Doppler shift. Okay, I don't know if I can't remember if I mentioned the Doppler shift. Um, and since you can just fast forward, uh, I'm going to go over what the Doppler shift is. Um, that way I know I've covered it because I can't remember. So, okay, Doppler shift. So, and this, this works, I'm, I'm going to do this with sound. Um, it works with uh, light the same way. Well, I'll do it with light. Okay, so if I've got a star, it's giving off radiation. If it's not moving, it's radiation, it's giving off in uh, every direction the same. And so the wave pattern is going to be the same. Now, if the star is actually moving, so say the star is moving in, in so this one isn't moving, but say it's moving in this direction, then the light is actually going to be compressed in the direction it's going because if the light wave is coming out and it's coming behind it, it's actually going to look more like this, where the wave is compressed in front and stretched out behind. This, where it's moving forward, would make it bluer, which is a shorter wavelength, and behind would make it redder. So if the whole spectra is shifted to the red, then you know it's moving towards you. If it's shifted towards the blue, then you know uh, it's moving away from you. If it shifted to the blue, you know it's moving towards you. Um, this happens with sound. That's why when you, you hear a siren, you know, a car moving at a high speed, it's siren towards you, you hear the wee and then it drops down as it passes by you because coming towards you, the sound waves are compressed to a higher sound. And as it goes past, it goes down to a lower sound. Interestingly enough, with sound, if you travel right at the speed of sound, the sound waves have nowhere to go. That energy generated by the sound doesn't actually leave the object. It stays the object. It would blow the object up. So airplanes cannot fly at the speed of sound. They have to fly faster or slower. If they fly at the speed of sound, which NASA found out testing that, uh, the airplane actually, uh, the energy builds up, shakes, and blows the airplane apart. So, okay. Okay. Classifying stars. Okay, so we classify everything. That's just what we do. So you got to put things in categories. There's a gazillion different stars. So you put them in uh, 
categories. Um, the first attempt, the first time, uh, they were done, uh, the classified by their spectrum. And specifically, they were done by absorption lines of hydrogen. And when they did this for the first time, they, they took the absorption lines of, of hydrogen and they, they lined them up, categorized them. They did it uh, A, B, C, D, et cetera. They classified them along that based upon the differences. Uh, for reasons that I don't completely understand, they said that now, you know what, we're going to go by surface temperature. That seems to be a better uh, way of, uh, excuse me, a better way of classifying them. And so the stars had already been labeled uh, based upon lives of hydrogen. So they didn't relabel the stars. Uh, they kept the labels, but they reshuffled them around based on temperature. So the current um, classification is by temperature. And so unfortunately, we have a system that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So it is currently O, B, A, F, G, A, M. So these are the hottest. These are the coolest. And yeah, I'm a little, we'll get into later. Uh, there are lots of these. These are super common. Those are super uncommon. Super hot stars tend to burn themselves out really quickly. They don't last long. These stars that are cool, well, they last quite a bit. So, uh, okay. So, uh, and then, so anyway, so they're classified this way and they're actually further subdivided. Um, subdivided zero through nine. So you can have a star that's an A2 or a G8. So a further of because yeah that doesn't seem to be enough so so that's the classification um, now it was interesting after they classified these whole thing uh, two uh, astronomers got together and they said you know what interested to compare stars um, with their luminosity versus their temperatures. You just plot them. So how luminous a star is versus temperature, plot it on a graph, see what happens. And so that resulted in the Bird Sprung Russell diagram. Thankfully abbreviated to the HR diagram. So I just keep saying hurts from Russell. Okay, and what these guys did, and I'm going to show you because that's going to be easier. So come with me over here. Why aren't you? Well, I'm not doing it on purpose because I've got to switch out. Okay, so okay, come on. There you go. Okay, so, um, that, okay, that's Spectre's plus. I got the paralyzed, which I'm gonna get to in a minute. So, okay, here is the, the diagram. And so for this diagram, what you have is temperature across the bottom. Okay, and up here, they've, they, they've done the, they, they put the two things on different sides. So the temperature down here is actually related to the spectral class. So they could have doubled it up on here, they didn't. So you've got O, B, A, F, G, K, M across and the temperatures. Surface temperature of 40,000 all the way down to 2,500. And then across here, you've got absolute magnitude or the luminosity. So 
you've got this is luminosity comparing by suns. So this is there's one time that's the sun, hundred times more energy than the sun, ten thousand and a million times the energy of the sun down to what a hundredth of the sun, and this is hundred ten hundred thousand. Uh, one ten thousandths of the uh, sun. Hold on just a minute. Okay, back to this. Okay, I know, it's a, it's a popular room today. Okay, so what this is showing is plotting out the various stars based upon their temperature versus luminosity. So, for instance, down in this corner, I've got something that's really hot, yet it's really dim. And so right here, I have got what is referred to as a white dwarf. Now, this is an extremely hot star, but it is incredibly dim. It's not producing much. And in fact, the reason why is that that star is about the size of Earth. So they're extremely faint stars. Now over here, this would make sense. I have got a star that's extremely cool and extremely dim. Kind of goes, makes sense. If it's cool, it's not gonna produce much. And then as you go along, this line, I go up here to hot and bright. This line of stars right here is referred to as the main sequence. And stars that are in the main sequence are stars that are in the stable part of their life. These are all stars that are taking hydrogen and turning it into helium. That's what stars do when they're healthy and, and, and well, not healthy, but when they are in the stable part of their life. Now, this star up here happens to be a star that is very cool, but is extremely bright. And how do we do that? Well, is it draw, drawn it there? They're incredibly large. This is a star that is probably, oh, on the order of being uh, a thousand times or more in size than our sun. So Betelgeuse is giving an example of, of what it looks like. Um, this line across here they've added are the diameters. So this is the size of the sun, 10 times the size, 1,000 times, uh, 100 times, 1,000 times, and then this is a tenth, a hundredth, a thousandth of the sun. So what I will talk about a little later, but I want you to notice is that it's interesting that as these stars get um, hotter, and brighter, they all stay about the same size. And we'll get to that when we talk about individual stars. But the fact that, that some of these stars, which are brighter and hotter, are about the same size as the sun. So, but they have more mass. So the more mass you add, it, it is actually, it's a balance between the hydrostatic pressure. So I've got more gravity pressure. But if I add more stuff, gravity gets stronger, but pressure does too. And it seems to kind of constantly balance. So for adding mass, gravity gets one time stronger, pressure gets the same time stronger, and it doesn't really actually move. So, hey, these are referred to as um, giant stars. You've got giants and super, uh, kind of like the giants and then super giants. And so these are stars that are all in the course of dying. If you're not found on the main sequence, they're actually in the process of dying. These stars are swelling up because they're not fusing hydrogen anymore. They're onto helium or something else, which fuses at a much higher temperature, which inflates the stars way up. Okay, here's another uh, showing the diagram uh, across. You got your grouping of giants, super giants, and you can see you've got stars that are on the red to the yellow, kind of greenish blue. Dwarf stars down here, and these are, as we'll talk about, technically not stars. They are um, actually the remnants of stars. They're not actually fusing anymore. So, okay. Back over here. Okay. So.
So this is a graph plotting temperature, which is uh, spectroplast OBG1 versus luminosity, which would also be absolute magnitude, big M. So what it shows in there, as I showed you in the picture, is that you have groupings of stars, your main sequence stars, giants, supergiants, and your dwarfs. Um, okay, so now what I wanted to, ooh, what I wanted to point out is spectroscopic. So yeah, let me go back here, because I didn't. Spectroscopic parallax. So spectroscopic parallax is a case where I know what the, the, the type of star is. So how do I figure out what its luminosity is? I know from the thing that I've got a, an A-class star. So I know the A-class star. Now, I know you, I could have an A-class star that's a giant, or I could have one that's a main sequence star. Well, the spectra are slightly different for um, a star that is a super giant, a giant versus a main sequence star. Um, the composition is a little bit different. So there are telltale signs in the spectra to let me know if it was a uh, main sequence star or if it was a uh, giant star. Now, there is a range, and I know this one doesn't show, but there is a range of these stars. But given that I know that this is what the spectral type is, because it matches this, I know that these stars are going to give me about a luminosity um, here in, oh, what is it, about, you know, what is it, about 10 times the sun. So it's going to give me a range. Once I have that range for the luminosity, I know the brightness, I can calculate the distance. If I happen to know that this one is more of a giant star, then I, can, I know that this is then the luminosity is 22,000 times of uh, the sun. I can calculate that way. But this is by saying, okay, I know what type of star it is. I can figure out what the luminosity is comparing it to those other stars. And now I know from that luminosity and the brightness, I can calculate the distance, so. Okay. Okay. And that wraps up that. So, yay. Another one done. Um, hope I didn't get too many people at the beginning. Eh. Okay. I'll beat her, Zane. <laughs>